Welcome to Cambridge House Live. I'm Bridget Anderson. I'm joined by Jayant Bhandari, an institutional advisor. Nice to have you with us. Uh, good to be here, Bridget. Jayant, you have just returned recently from a trip to India. There's a lot of focus on India as one of the BRIC countries and definitely a lot of growth potential there. Give us an idea of what you see happening on the ground. Uh, well, I think it's uh, uh, a lot of what you hear about India is a myth. India oh, really? is yeah India has India is growing at only a rate of 4% 4 4 4.5%. It's a very stagnant economy, extraordinarily corrupt and increasingly chaotic. So I, I think it's it's uh, people want to promote India because it's a democratic country, but that's mostly mass rule. So it's very hard to make any comparisons then with some of the growth and what we're seeing out of China. Uh, I think it's completely incorrect to compare it with China. Mm -hmm. Chinese economy on a per capita basis is four times that of India. And Chinese growth rate is twice as much as that of uh, India. So they are totally incomparable uh, countries. I spend a lot of time in China and I, when I go to China from India, I, uh, it, I start feeling as if China is a first world country. It's really? so much better than India is. Well, what do you think it's going to take or how long is it going to take for India to, to really be on that path then? I, I don't think there's a, a short term solution to India's problems. Uh, India's problems are becoming worse by the day. About 50 million people have joined the workforce in the last five years but the net unemployment has gone up by 50 million people. So uh, Indian economy is actually not only stagnating, the number of unemployment is increasing, and these are the people with very high expectations from their life. Yet there's still a lot of investors looking towards India as a, a real potential growth prospect. I mean, you can always find a good place to invest in. There's mm -hmm. always a sector or a company that you can invest in. But uh, as a country, uh, people uh, fall for a myth, they fall for euphorias and they invest their money and they lose their money and then they pull their money out. And this has been happening over the last 10, 20 years. And so what would it take then for some of that to change? You know, when I think about China, one of the things that I think has moved that country along is that, you know, a lot of people who are below middle class have moved up the ranks. There's been more consumption. And, and, and so those kinds of things have certainly helped growth. But you're talking about the unemployment problem in India. And it sounds like until that can really be addressed that we're not going to see some of the growth. Uh, yeah, but also education in India is very bad. People are very badly trained. Uh, they are not disciplined. The work ethic is very bad. And the society hasn't really done much to address those issues. So I, I don't see any solution of India's problem for the next 5, 10, 15 years. I think it probably has to uh, fall into smaller countries to actually be able to uh, uh, progress properly. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very fragmented, it's a mass rule, and the, the governments, because they are voted into power by people who are not educated or don't really understand much, they tend to vote for increasingly progressive policies. So uh, I see things getting worse and worse going forward rather than improving in the short term, or even in the medium term. Now you were uh, based in Vancouver, but you a couple of years ago moved to Singapore. So talk to us about the climate there then. Well, Singapore is a great place. It's a very friendly place. It's a very extraordinarily safe place. And people, uh, uh, it's, it's not necessarily a full democracy, uh, the way Western people like to see uh, a country being. But I don't really care much because it's a very free country. I can move around uh, whenever I want to. A 16-year-old girl can go out at 2 o'clock in the night just about anywhere in the country and it's no problems. It's a very safe place. Let's take a, a look at what's uh, happening in the junior mining sector. Um, obviously, 2012, 2013, really difficult years, dismal years. Uh, there is some sort of sentiment that maybe we might have seen the end of the decline. What is your feeling? Uh, I, I want to see what happens over the next few weeks because the last one month uh, increase in the share prices of companies could have been a result of the end of tax loss selling uh, that, that was happening in the later part of last year. So I'm not sure. Uh, and in fact, the fact that gold is still hovering around 1250, which is still $50 more than where it was a few, few weeks back, people might have entered a phase of euphoria 
despite the fact that most mining companies are still making a huge loss uh, selling gold at 1250. So do you think there's more consolidation to come in the sector? I think there's a, unless gold price recovers, uh, goes up significantly in a short period of time, I think there will be, a, there's still a lot of hardship going forward. What do you think, what do you foresee happening with the price of gold in the short term then? Um, well, I, uh, I'm not sure. I think gold has not really done what it should have done over the last three, four years. So I don't know what might happen. I do know one thing that at least the, uh, India consumes about 25% of international mm -hmm. gold. And Indian, as I said, Indian economy is stagnating and Indians no longer have the financial mo power to buy more gold, particularly if the gold price goes up. So uh, you, act, you might actually have an excess uh, falling demand in, uh, in India. And economically, what do you see happening for the U.S. and for Canada in 2014? Um, I, I, don't, I don't know what might happen here just in one year. I think it's a too short a period. But I think uh, these economies are clearly stagnating. Uh, uh, salaries are falling. Unemployment is going up. And people have become very much orient, uh, very entitlement oriented. Uh, people in Western countries expect uh, things to be given to them as their right, rather than uh, something that they request for. So, what is your investment approach then? Given what you see from, you've got quite a global perspective. What is your approach to investing? Well, I I look at the current gold price, or a slightly lower than the current gold price, and I I see. If using a 20% discount rate, I can get an upside in investing in those companies. So I'm not investing for gold, I'm investing in equities based on a certain price of gold, which is either the spot price or lower than the spot price. And I want a 20% return on my investment. Otherwise, it makes no sense to invest in it. A lot of these companies have, uh, before 2008 or uh, in those days, were uh, trading as if they were going to give a return of 5% or, or less, which makes absolutely no sense to me. And that's why I think there's a lot more hardship to come in this industry. Okay, well, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for having me.